This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Jeff Ratliff with the Neurology Podcast and Thomas Jefferson University. I'm here with Callum Hamilton. Callum is a researcher on cognitive aging at the Translational and Clinical Research Institute at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. He's the lead author of a paper published in neurology titled Outcomes of Patients with Mild Cognitive Impairment with Lewy Bodies or Alzheimer's Disease at Three and Five Years After Diagnosis. The study was published in the July 23rd issue of Neurology. And in this study, Callum and his colleagues evaluated the progression of cognitive impairment and clinical outcomes in a cohort of patients diagnosed with MCI of either an Alzheimer's type or dementia with Lewy Bodies type. Callum, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jeff. Callum, before we start dissecting the results, I'd like to learn a little bit more about the patients in this study. And so it sounds like the primary goal here was to evaluate what happens to patients who have been diagnosed with MCI over a three to five year follow up after that diagnosis is made. Can you teach us about the MCI diagnoses that were made here? How do we define MCI? And specifically, when looking at patients with an Alzheimer's type or a dementia with Lewy body type, how did you define some of those subtypes as well? The pivotal group really here were that MCI with Lewy bodies group that we were really interested in. The challenge, as I'm sure you could imagine, is certainly a few years ago when we were recruiting these and potentially still now, is that isn't really a group that exists currently in in health services, certainly near us. People might be diagnosed with dementia with Lewy bodies, or they might be diagnosed with MCI, but they weren't being diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment with Lewy bodies. And so that was a challenge that we had to circumvent. So firstly, what we did was we just looked for anyone who had been diagnosed with MCI in our local healthcare services in in Northeast England. So our team were very busy going to all the person's memory services, psychiatry, neurology, and general medicine, just to try and identify anyone who'd been recently diagnosed with a mild cognitive impairment. And at this stage, all we sought to do is bring those people into our research, consent them to take part, and take a closer look at them. So initially, we just wanted to verify that their diagnosis in the health services of MCI lined up with MCI as we were approaching it. So specifically, we were defining MCI as being um, a concern about someone's decline in cognitive function, whether that was a concern in themselves, whether that was in a caregiver or family member, um, or potentially a clinician who knew them well enough to comment on this. Um, But crucially, they also had to have some objective evidence supporting this. So we gave them a fairly detailed cognitive assessment just to check that actually they met that criteria. These were people who did not have dementia. So they had relatively maintained independence in their day-to-day functioning, albeit with that objective functional impairment. So it was quite a narrow window that people had to meet where they were sufficiently convincing in their MCI that they were eligible to take part, but not too impaired that they were no longer MCI. So some people were eliminated at this stage already, maybe in the time between when they'd been diagnosed in healthcare services and us seeing them, they might have worsened, they already had dementia, or maybe they just use a slightly different criteria to us. But once we had that group pulled together of MCI, we then looked in more detail for these indicators of Lewy body disease. So we were very fortunate to have a very experienced panel of old age psychiatrists, people who run some local dementia and Lewy body specific clinics. And they reviewed the research notes of those people we brought in to try to identify the presence or absence of the core clinical features of dementia with Lewy bodies. So complex visual hallucinations, fluctuating attention and cognition, REM sleep behavior disorder, and clinical Parkinsonism were all assessed in this study. And this was also supported by two biomarkers. So these are FBCIT imaging of the dopaminergic system and MIBG cardiac scintigraphy. So we had four core features and two possible biomarkers to look for here. And if people had either two or more of these four features or one core feature and any one abnormal biomarker, 
then they met the criteria for MCI with Lewy bodies. And anyone familiar with the dementia with Lewy bodies criteria will see that this is essentially mirroring that, but instead of the all cause dementia, they had in any cause. We then had to try and match these with our Alzheimer's disease groups. Partly this could be recruited either from people who were initially brought in potentially as an MCI with Lewy bodies, but who didn't meet that threshold, or we could find people who just had any MCI and eliminated any other possible causes. So anyone with a suspected frontotemporal etiology was excluded, anyone with a suspected vascular etiology, particularly supported by our MRI that we used during the research. And what that left us with was these two groups, our MCI with Lewy bodies and our MCI due to Alzheimer's disease. Got it. So you looked broadly clinically looking to recruit patients who had a suspicion for MCI and then did apply some objective assessments of cognition to make sure that they were not meeting criteria for dementia, but did have some cognitive impairment. And then once you had that cohort then applied some of those clinical features, Lewy body-related disorders, Parkinsonism, cognitive fluctuations, REM behavior disorder, visual hallucinations, looked for those in your cohort, and then also used some of these imaging biomarkers, either the dopamine imaging or some of the cardiac nuclear medicine imaging. And through some combination of biomarkers, you're able to define a DLB MCI cohort. And so now we know about that cohort you're following. And so let's get to the results. So you've defined the cohort and now you're going to follow them over three years and five years. What can you tell us about the proportion that went on to develop dementia or meet another of your predefined outcomes that you were looking for? Yes, absolutely. So our primary outcome of interest then, as you say, was dementia, which is obviously particularly important in an MCI context. So previous studies vary, maybe one in four or about half of people might progress from MCI to dementia over a long period of time. And our results were more towards that that latter number. So about half of our group by three years had developed dementia. This was about the same in both of these two disease groups. This was offset slightly by the fact that ours is a relatively older cohort. So they're in their 70s generally when they were recruited. And so there's obviously this competing outcome, which is another negative outcome, which is premature death, which unfortunately happens in about one in 10 people who passed away before dementia was seen within that early stage of MCI. And if we expand it up towards the five-year outcome, it was creeping more towards about two in three people who developed dementia by that point again, with a quite a high rate of mortality by then. So this is the upper end of what we'd see in previous studies. When looking at the conversion to dementia, and as we said, it was about 50% at three years and about two-thirds at five years, were there differences in the rates of progression or the incidence of progression between the DLB cohort and the Alzheimer's MCI cohort, or were those rates of progression about the same? The incidence at about three and five year was about the same, largely indistinguishable. What we have seen previously reported from a subset of this cohort very early on is that there may have been a very slightly faster progression in the Lewy body group over the first one to two years. What we're seeing in this longer term follow up though is by this point, whether it happened a bit quicker or a bit slower, generally they were still reaching that same endpoint by these major milestones. Okay, understood. So it doesn't seem like, at least at this level, that there's a clear faster progression subtype or slower progression subtype. It's more clinically defining those subtypes by some of those clinical criteria that we met earlier or discussed earlier. So you're finding about half would meet criteria for dementia at three years, but acknowledging about one in 10 did die in that period of observation. And then at five years, it was about two thirds with another higher incidence who had died in that follow-up. As we're looking now at these subtypes, right? And so you mentioned, as we just talked about, a DLB subtype or an Alzheimer's subtype. How strong or what were the capabilities of those pre-dementia MCI definitions at predicting the eventual development of a clinically defined Alzheimer's dementia or actual dementia with Lewy bodies? What we found is that 
generally these classifications were really quite stable. So of those with probable MCI with Lewy bodies who developed dementia, all of them developed a probable dementia with Lewy bodies. There were a small number of people who moved up in the scale. So there were some who we've maybe not quite touched on who were considered possible MCI with Lewy bodies. They didn't quite meet that diagnostic threshold initially, but some of those developed up towards a probable DLB with the passage of time. But the key thing is they weren't going the opposite direction. We weren't seeing anyone initially as a probable MCI with Lewy bodies who then was developing Alzheimer's disease at the onset of dementia. And another group I wanted to talk about in this study was there was a small subset of patients who did die and had brains donated for a neuropathological evaluation and diagnosis, acknowledging that these are small numbers, not a primary outcome of this study, but of the patients with either these dementia with Lewy body subtypes or Alzheimer's subtypes of MCI, What did you learn about the ultimate neuropathological diagnosis in that handful of cases? We're very fortunate at Newcastle University in that we have a human brain bank just based within our research building and really good links with the people who work at that brain bank. And so we were able to approach our participants when they first took part to see if they'd be interested in volunteering for brain tissue donation. So to date, we have had 10 people who have passed away and very kindly donated their brains for that pathological assessment. And also to date, we have seen 100% accuracy of those clinical classifications for everyone who was first considered in these studies. We've had 10 people, one of whom was eliminated at baseline because the panel suspected that they had a primarily vascular cognitive impairment, and that classification was ratified when they passed away. Of the nine remaining who remained in this study, five of those had Lewy body disease, neocortical Lewy body disease, when they passed away. Four of those five also had Alzheimer's disease, which is not inconsistent with what we'd expect, knowing that AD copathology is very common in DLB. And our last four were people who were initially classified as MCI due to Alzheimer's, and again, they had Alzheimer's disease neuropathologically. I think that point you made is very important as well, that the clinical syndrome in life was consistent with a DLB phenotype or clinical type, but acknowledging that ultimately the neuropathology can be very mixed in these patients and a coincident or comorbid Alzheimer's pathology, it sounds like, again, small numbers, but was pretty common in what you found. I think that's where the terminology becomes quite important. This is MCI with Lewy bodies, dementia with Lewy bodies. That does not necessarily mean without Alzheimer's disease. So we have to be very careful of that. Maybe it's semantic, but I think it's a good point of distinction to make. Zooming back out, how would you advise neurologists to track these types of patients over time? If we as neurologists seeing patients are able to identify someone who's meeting criteria for MCI, and we apply some of those clinical criteria above, such as a REM behavior disorder or the presence of some visual hallucinations, or we're seeing some Parkinsonism on our exam, and we're suspecting this is a dementia with Lewy body subtype of MCI, then what do we do? How has this study influenced or should it influence our conversations and our approach to those types of patients? A really important point to emphasize first is that certainly for now, these, certainly the MCI with Lewy bodies criteria remain research criteria. They are not quite yet clinical criteria, but the hope is that these will be validated and replicated in other cohorts and that those clinical criteria may follow soon. If that is the case, I think this gives a real opportunity to open up and use some of the existing knowledge that we have on dementia with Lewy bodies, especially how is that managed, how is this identified, and see if that can be applied in this prodromal stage, whether that's in terms of pharmacological or non-pharmacological treatments, repurposing existing management toolkits, for example. But I think there's another really important opportunity there, which is communication with patients. So often what we've seen, you know, I mentioned earlier that there's this gap that MCI with Lewy bodies doesn't really exist in the health services. Is that when we would first meet people who are entering these studies, there was a huge amount of confusion. You know, they would ask, I've been told that I don't have dementia, but that I have dementia with Lewy bodies. 
How can that be? How do we balance that? And I think being able to communicate more clearly with patients as to what stage they're at versus the underlying cause and how those might differ from what's been discussed previously, I think there's a real opportunity there for that communication. Well, Callum, thank you. I think that's been really helpful for our listeners. I've been speaking with Callum Hamilton about his paper in the journal Neurology titled Outcomes of Patients with Mild Cognitive Impairment with Lewy Bodies or Alzheimer's Disease at three and five years after diagnosis. Please do check it out in the journal Neurology. And thank you, Callum, for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Jeff. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please Take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.